Somewhere along a path between the marsh of a ditch and a railway upon an esker, like many Canadians, I grew up in the rural, a part of southwestern Ontario. Haudenosaunee, Lene Lunep, and Anishinaabe territory. Although the land was hemmed in by roads and fences as a motley crew of kids, we roamed. We roamed across the wide acreage with a pack of loyal farm dogs, across cultivated fields and polluted creek beds. We followed corn row paths back to scrub brush and furled them till rust on the tassels told us it was combine season. Beware the rotating blades that could not hear or see. And we harbored very little concern for the borders of property. In a lot of ways, I think we felt removed from the geopolitical, because as kids, we moved freely. So lucky. Quieted away in that difficult and generative time and place, did not know or understand the term migrant. Within the Canadian nation state, as a displaced child of hybrid ancestry, I did not realize how a border or borders were inscribed upon my very own body, so often assumed to be foreign. I do come from people who have endured stark and disabling conditions, multiple displacements, people whose papers, perhaps, have become unregularized. But this is not uncommon in the world, and I was comforted to learn at a young age that actually this is quite common. So the combined difficulties of citizens and migrants led to me being born in Canada, led to me being entrusted to the Canadian state. And as a ward of the state, I was fostered and adopted to that family and that farm that I mention. And I was fostered again. I crossed the United States and the Canadian border a number of times in a number of places in my youth, not knowing that some of those routes were ones that my biological father had taken, having had limited status here as a traveling worker, of workers, crossing for lengths and generations, necessary journeys north, to reach, in some ways, a more secure state, though still one of non-belonging within Canada. And I think this is particularly the case for at some intersections of black African ancestry today. In more recent years, through my work in migrant justice organizing and in prison solidarity work and working within communities of displaced people, I've come to realize that, of course, citizenship is an achievement for some, with incredible intense labor behind it. And for others, citizenship is a deeply unconsidered privilege. Borders determine sovereign privileges. As the poet Hari Aluri notes from the border city of San Diego, writing recently in Poetry International, that feeling that moment, that untroubled moment of citizenship, when we are untroubled in our mobility. This, this is the opposite at what people who are being identified as undesirable are experiencing right now, being told explicitly and implicitly, both at the border and within them, that they are no longer or no longer one of us. It is through the imagination of the border, Aluri notes, that the figure of the illegal has been invented. Yet many of us agree, no one is illegal. The displaced, the migrant, is not inherently criminal. But no matter, no matter one's citizenship, some must always have their papers at hand. What kind of country looms in your imagination where racially profiled people are carded, singled out, and separated 
at times with grave implications. Is that Canada for you? On traditional ancestral indigenous territories, daily, racially profiled people, including indigenous persons, face demands for ID from officers. We are reminded that regardless of citizenship, we may be suspect and subject to identification, classification, registration, to be known by our numbers, and to be surveilled every time we cross that border. And most especially, should we be taken aside for further questioning? Belarusian poet Valzinia Mort notes that the border is neither a line nor a long, tall fence, but a waiting room. And there, people are stripped of everything except for the meat that can sit or stand upon request. And the weight of that bureaucracy permeates every aspect of our lives, our unification with family, our access to economy, to health, education, mobility. For those made to feel it, the border is everywhere. And yet people risk their lives trying to cross borders. People risk their lives just trying to reach the border. And the number of people risking these journeys today is the highest it's ever been. The United Nations Refugee Agency reports that over 65.3 million people, so that's one in 113 people globally, have been displaced due to conflict or persecution just in 2015. Resource extraction, environmental degradation, wars, famines. There are terrible famines on the planet right now. Borders, markets, policies. The Canadian state and our way of life here is implicated. We are implicated in the displacement of people globally. Thirsty queues cross thresholds of deserts and frostbiting weather, frigid and perilous bodies of water, journeying thousands of miles on foot at incredible risk, people move, traveling with children. And every day, police arrest and detain refugees and asylum seekers crossing the border into Canada into the open arms of a carceral giant, enforcing a safe third country edict. Because in Canada, we regularly detain migrants, and that's thousands of people currently. There are unregularized people being held in maximum security provincial jails, that's prisons, without charges and indefinitely. Because in Canada, we have no time limits on immigration detention. People can be held here for years and we detain children in Canada. Foregrounding scarcity rather than abundance, augmenting the fear of others instead of valuing our incredible differences, hardening borders instead of engendering a more permeable vision of citizenship. Carved into the concrete borders, zoos to prisons, those dear, are in cages under the public library here in Vancouver and at the airport. Borders better sides beneath hospital and holding cell windows. Should we have an understanding of our history? Should we be responsible for our occupation on these territories? Then we would decolonize immigration. If borders determine sovereign privileges, then we would look to indigenous leadership and poetics, to the land and to the water, to inform our ways forward. I recall the mobility of my youth, and that freedom engenders my poetics of poetry sans frontières. Poetry that shelters, travels and transmits, and warms hands and comforts feet permanently. Feet, blistering failures will keep leaving the ground, 
left, right, left, right, until they rest. <laughs> 